Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 5, April 19th to the 25th, 1861. Last week, we talked about the events of Fort Sumter and the opening stages of the war. President Lincoln has discarded the olive branch in favor of letting slip the hogs of war. And yes, that is an Archer reference, in case you were not aware. Anyway, 75,000 men have been called to end the rebellion, a task that was estimated to last only three months. Virginia has joined the other southern states, allowing the Confederacy to have the richest slave state among its ranks. Before we move forward, I do need to mention I made a little bit of a boo-boo last week. I made a mistake. I I called Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard, Pierre Toutant Gustave Beauregard. So my apologies and kudos if you caught that, but just figured I would correct myself. PGT being the abbreviation there, so that's what we'll that's what we'll go by in the future here. But anyway, let's take a look at this week. On April 19th, President Abraham Lincoln will call for the blockading of southern ports. If you did not know, a blockade is usually conducted by sea, but it is an effort in war to cut off supplies coming in or out of enemy territory. This would be a tough task, given the U.S. Navy has only 35 modern vessels at the outbreak of the war. Jefferson Davis, the Confederate president, had already called for southern vessels to conduct raiding actions on Union merchants. Effectively, it's a sort of saying that it's okay to be a pirate. But we'll talk about those raiders uh, in a future episode. Pretty soon they they come into play here. Uh, Pretty important, so we will talk about that in a future episode. We mentioned in our build-up episodes the importance of southern ports. Obviously, they are exporting cotton and importing a variety of goods, you know, foodstuffs, luxury items, things like that. But when war is declared, they'll still be exporting cotton, but importing military supplies. And I know we did talk about last week how Virginia would allow the South for at least some manufacturing but they're still going to be receiving supplies from European powers who are more than uh, willing to trade those and for, for cotton. Uh, but we will also talk about the role of European powers such as Britain and France in a future episode. So cutting back on the cotton going out and specifically military supplies coming in is going to be a concern. And nipping that is going to be the vision of one of the American greats, Winfield Scott. I want to take just a little bit of time to talk about Winfield Scott. He has been mentioned a time or two in the last couple of episodes, but I think he deserves a deeper look. Scott was born in 1786 outside Petersburg, Virginia. He attends William and Mary before joining the army in 1808. During the War of 1812, Scott Starr rises quickly, becoming a general at 27. A year later, he commands a brigade in the Niagara Campaign of 1814, performing well at the Battle of Chippewa and being severely wounded at Lundy's Lane. Scott would go on to command troops in the Seminole War and the already mentioned column of troops who capture Mexico City during the Mexican-American War. In 1841, he had become the commander-in-chief of the army. Although a military man, during the nullification crisis and disputes over the Canadian border in the north, he proved himself as a good mediator as well. In 1852, he was the Whig nomination for president, losing to Franklin Pierce. Scott was extremely self-confident. So extremely self-confident that we can describe it as arrogant. 
Scott would have rivalries with other officers, including Andrew Jackson. Without even meeting Jackson, the two would engage in verbal battles via letter, eventually seeing Jackson challenge Scott to a duel. And this, the, the slight that Jackson challenges Scott to a duel over is really like no, no big deal. Like it's, it's sort of like a passing criticism, like no, nothing to be upset about now. Cer- certainly, it's like something that you probably have received in uh, one of those work emails that you get where it's, it's like not too critical, but it's also taking a little jab at you. Yeah, I, I know you, you probably have received an email like that. So that's, that's what it's like. And Jackson decides, hey, I'm going to challenge Scott to a duel. And Winfield Scott is going to decline, which is something that he's going to be criticized over for the rest of his life. Like you decline one duel, and then people get all over you. And I'm sure we all know how that feels. Scott would also have a distaste for Confederate President Jefferson Davis, the two clashing while Davis was the Secretary of War under Pierce. Scott has his handprints all over the Civil War. Now you may be wondering how this could be. You might be saying all this stuff about a general who will resign in October of 1861 is all well and good, but why spend so much time discussing him? Many of the generals in the war would serve under Scott in the Mexican campaign. Effectively, this would be, for many, their only battlefield experience prior to the war between the states. As junior officers, they would learn valuable lessons under Scott. Flanking maneuvers, attacking the enemy where they are weakest, the importance of supply lines, as well as in attempting to limit guerrilla operations were all things that can be seen in the campaigns to come and that Scott employed in the 1840s. Being from Virginia, Scott would also advocate for the advancement of young Southern officers. Scott wanted to live the lifestyle of European aristocracy, which had a good comparison to wealthy Southern families. Many sons of the South would rise through the ranks in this way. Finally, Scott was a big admirer of the French, and by 1861, there was definitely a French influence on the army. He was actually sent to France to observe after his involvement in the War of 1812. General regulations for the army was written by Scott in 1821. The U.S. Army would be patterned after European examples, especially the French, as we mentioned, who are seen as the premier army at the start of the Civil War. Winfield Scott is still the overall commander of the U.S. Army by 1861. He is 75 years old and not in good health. In fact, he does most of his business while lying down, and he needs a lot of help to get on a horse. In his older age, he does not dislike any kind of food, which I don't really fault him for because... If I had a very long and successful career and toward the end I decided that I'm just going to eat whatever I wanted to eat, I mean, you know, more power to you there. So not uh, not going to fault him for that. Despite this, he is still just as fiery, though, stating that if there is any attempt on the president's life during his inauguration, Scott will have cannons pointed at Virginia and Maryland that will blow them to bits. It is telling of the old general from Virginia that he would not turn his back on his country, having served them faithfully for the majority of his life. In fact, there is a popular neighborhood in Richmond called Scott's Edition, and that's where that comes from. It's a, it's a Winfield Scott used to, used to own that property. So Scott would come up with a plan that we will see eventually working by the end of the war. It was known as the Anaconda Plan. And that's actually a name that Winfield Scott disliked, but that's what it came to be called as. Now, an anaconda, we know, is a constrictor, meaning it suffocates its prey before eating it. That is a good visualization for what Winfield Scott proposed. As already mentioned, the blockade of southern ports was underway. Depriving the South economically would force peace negotiations. In addition, the dividing of the Confederacy was important to Scott. This could be done 
by taking control of the Mississippi River, in the process capturing New Orleans, which is the largest city in the Confederacy at this time. Now obviously, this plan would take a while. Digestion of an animal could take three to five days in the case of an anaconda, let alone how long it takes to slowly squeeze the life out of its prey. And actually, the anaconda plan is it's, it's a critical nickname of what Scott comes up with, so that's, that's probably why he didn't like it. The war was considered to be an event that would not take long at all. Impatience would take over, and for some time the plan was discarded. But there are examples of pieces of the anaconda plan that will live on. And as we move forward, I'll be sure to point those out. Last week, we talked about Virginia and their vote to secede from the Union. I would like to mention two important events in the immediate aftermath of this decision. They would be the important seizures of Harper's Ferry and Norfolk. And these actually start on April 18th. Yes, I know that that was from technically last week, but the combined events happen from the 18th into this week, so I'm counting it. And if you are outraged by this, may I remind you that it is in fact my party, and I will cry about making dates flow better in the narrative if I want to. Anyway, on April 18th, Virginia militia forces will seize Harper's Ferry. The small federal garrison stationed there attempted to burn the arsenal, but the flames were extinguished by the civilians there. Machinery was transferred down to Richmond, as well as any stores of rifles. And I know we may have briefly mentioned this during the John Brown raid episode, but Harper's Ferry is not going to be a good place to try to defend because there are hills that completely surround the city. So I don't, I don't know if that is a good visual, but it's like in a, in a bowl with these two rivers, and you, know, you can sit up on the hills and, and fire into the city if you're a military force trying to take it. So uh, it's not going to be really fought over too much, but uh, we'll, that will play a, a future part in our episodes to come here. So stay tuned. Virginia militia would also move to capture Gosport Navy Yard in Norfolk. This is a key naval base. It was the largest facility that could repair and build ships in the South. The Union commander attempted to scuttle the vessels and set fire to the yard. Scuttling is the deliberate sinking of a vessel by allowing water to fill from the hole, so below the waterline. Confederates were able to acquire a large store of gunpowder, and in addition, they were able to save a ship called the USS Merrimack. Although badly burned, the hull and the engines were still intact, which would be good news for the small Confederate Navy. This would become the famous CSS Virginia and participate in probably the most famous naval episode of the war, which is the duel between the Virginia or the Merrimack and the Monitor. So we will talk about them soon. Staying in Virginia, we have on the 26th Virginia forces coming under the command of one Robert E. Lee. We've met Lee before when we talked about John Brown and his raid on Harper's Ferry, but I think that this will be a great spot to fully introduce one of the main figures of the war. Lee was born in 1809 in Westmoreland County, Virginia, the son of light horse Harry Lee, who's a hero of the Revolutionary War. Lee would attend West Point in 1825 and graduate without a demerit, although it is important to note that you could do extra work to work off demerits from your record, so that's not to say that maybe Robert E. Lee got a demerit, but he just simply worked it off, but he, he finishes with none, so we're counting that. He would serve as an engineer in the Mexican War, attracting the eye of General Winfield Scott during the Veracruz campaign and capture of Mexico City. Directly before the war, Lee was assigned to the cavalry in Texas. It was while on leave that Robert E. Lee would take command of the Marines during John Brown's raid. Robert E. Lee was married to Mary Ann Randolph Custis, a great-grandchild of Martha Washington, by her first marriage, 
inheriting the Custis estate at Arlington, across from the river from the capital. And this is Arlington. The, the house is still there. It is on the grounds of Arlington Cemetery now, so uh, that's, that's the house. At the outbreak of the war, Lee was recalled and offered the field command of the U.S. troops upon Winfield Scott's recommendation. Remember, Scott thought highly of young Southern officers and also highly of Lee after the Mexican-American War. Lee declined, opting to follow his home state of Virginia. Upon secession, Lee would resign his commission. Another important fact to note is that, politically, Lee was a Whig and not necessarily supportive of slavery. Those slaves he inherited from his father-in-law, he actually emancipated. So, fun fact there. Moving south, North Carolina militia will seize the Charlotte Mint on April 21st, 1861. As a little backstory, it will surprise you to maybe find out that the first gold rush in the United States occurs in 1799 in North Carolina. Gold would also be discovered in Georgia in 1828. We talked a while back about the California gold rush in 1849. Many of the experienced miners would play a crucial part in this new gold rush. That's actually why UNC Charlotte's nickname is the 49ers, for that reason, recognizing the miners who left to go to California in the new gold rush. So that's why they have that nickname there. In 1835, our old friend, Andrew Jackson, will sign a bill into law that will see the opening of three mints. One of them was, you guessed it, Charlotte. The other two will be in Georgia and Louisiana, respectfully. The other two mints would also be seized by Confederate forces. At this point, there had already been a couple thousand half-eagles made by the mint stamped 1861. A half-eagle would have the value of $5. After the Charlotte Mint was seized by the state militia of North Carolina, the Mint would continue to operate and make 800-some more coins. Gold ore ran out soon after, though, and the Mint would be turned into a hospital and office for the remainder of the war. Just as a brief aside, money in the Civil War was a little different. Paper money was issued on both sides, but it was not backed with silver or gold, especially in the case of the South. In the North, President Lincoln would turn to Salmon P. Chase, the Secretary of the Treasury. Interesting to note that Chase was a big fan of the phrase, In God We Trust, which he started to print on coins. You might whip out of your wallet right now and see that somewhere. Greenbacks were issued named because of the green print on the back. If you take a look at the picture of one, they look pretty close to our money today. Demand notes were issued to pay duties as well as United States notes. Congress would pass the first Legal Tender Act, printing 150 million of these notes. In the South, there were 70 different types of currency, making things just a little bit confusing. Many banks businesses, and private companies had their own sets. As the war drew on, the Confederate states printed more money. This led to inflation, prices swelling by 17 times in some cases. A pair of shoes would cost $600 by the end of the war. We can shift to another state in the Upper South, Arkansas. Much like Virginia, they will decline to send troops to join Lincoln's 75,000. Also, like Virginia, they had taken a wait-and-see approach to the proceedings following South Carolina and others seceding from the Union. We mentioned when talking about the election of 1860 how border states appealed to Unionist John Bell, and Arkansas was no exception. When deciding to call for a convention on secession, the vote of the people was approximately 27,000 for and 15,000 against. In the convention itself, Unionist David Walker would be voted as the convention president, and the Unionists would hold the majority. During the convention, Governor Henry Rector would give a speech, quoted as saying of the North, 
They believe slavery is a sin, and we do not. There lies the trouble. Despite there being rumblings for secession, the state would stay in the Union and work with other border states to find a peaceful solution. After Fort Sumter, the situation would change. Already in February, the federal arsenal had been seized in Little Rock by militia. The 22nd seized the initial refusal to send troops against fellow southern states. On the 23rd, Fort Smith is seized by militia troops. Fort Smith had been established as a frontier fort in 1817, and it would witness the forced relocation of the tribes in the east as they passed through on their way to Oklahoma. While the majority of the U.S. forces stationed at Fort Smith had already departed, the capture of the fort was important for recruiting purposes. Many would rush to enlist. That is a good place to leave off for this week. Moving forward, we will keep in mind Winfield Scott and his Anaconda plan. More of the states in the Upper South are turning away from the Union and gathering resources. Next week, I want to have a conversation regarding Army organization, as well as many terms that will be important as we move forward. In addition, Abraham Lincoln will suspend habeas corpus. So we'll talk about why next week. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Once again, feedback is appreciated. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. In the show description, there should be a link to the website, as well as the Patreon and Venmo information. So your support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Thank you, and have a great week.